Welcome to A Clinical Breath, respiratory insights from industry leaders. A Clinical Breath provides the community with the latest respiratory developments, trends, and expertise, all aimed at improving patient outcomes. Today's episode is brought to you by Monahan Medical Corporation. Monahan means it matters. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Opinions are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Monaghan Medical Corporation. Welcome to A Clinical Breath, Respiratory Care Insights from Industry Leaders. Joining us is Dr. Michael Bowman, a pediatric pulmonologist. Welcome, Dr. Bowman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to talk about something very important, and that is the necessity to identify asthma triggers. Could we begin by telling us what we mean by asthma triggers? That is a challenge to get across to families. It's also something that I think is really unique about asthma compared to other health conditions. Every youngster who has asthma has certain situation settings Uh, exposures that make their lungs go crazy. There are general irritants that cause problems. There are allergies that cause problems. And there are individual other things that cause problems. And it's now part of the guidelines that when someone is getting care for asthma, it's crucial that the triggers be identified and that there be almost as much effort at removing the effect of those triggers Mm -hmm. as there is on treating the asthma uh, because they go hand in hand. And so uh, triggers can be extra, they can be irritants like diesel exhaust, cigarette smoke, those sorts of things. I understand that people wearing scents, perfumes or colognes in some instances can also act as a trigger. Yes. uh, I had a young lady who had asthma that went out of control when she went back to school and we changed her medicine. The family was compliant. It wasn't until November that we realized that the girl next to her liked body spray. And Mm -hmm. when when the girls were put in different corners of the room, her asthma got totally well controlled. Mm -hmm. So scents are an issue in South Carolina where I live. We not only prohibit school buses from idling on property, also a voluntary program to get parents to not idle their cars because we don't want the kids in pickup line right next to where there's a lot of pollution going. One thing you just alluded to but didn't dwell on is most people think, well, it's all pollen, it's all allergy related, but you're going way beyond that in terms of the the array of triggers out there. Yes, that is a common misconception. It used to be thought that 90% of asthma was allergy driven, and it's probably a good bit over 50% now, but it's not anywhere near 90%. And as we recognize more, uh, some youngsters have exercise as a trigger, some have viral illnesses as a trigger, uh, some have acid reflux as a trigger. Well, it seems to me one of the jobs, if you're going to try and get at the triggers, is to do an extensive inventory of the child's living environment, their social environment. How does one go about doing that? A lot of it is is history. You're exactly right that it's extremely important to do that. And that's part of the fun of caring for a youngster with asthma. It's a, a detective uh, challenge to, to undertake. I have had one uh, major asthma flare up myself in my whole life. And it happened uh, just a couple of years ago after being at my son's house and sitting around the fire pit for two hours. And lo and behold, a couple of hours later, I couldn't breathe and I was on my way to the ER. Some people have problems with uh, hay and they don't do well if they go to the state fair. There's also uh, sanitation chemicals that are used to clean and disinfect. That would obviously also fall into certain people might be sensitive to those yes, elements and, as well. And cleaning chemicals and such, uh, insecticides, paint, those are, are more irritants. That's not an allergy to them, but it's an irritant. and uh, Which is a trigger. So, yes, yes, very mm-hmm. definitely. Mm-hmm. And so that's why it's strongly recommended that in schools, those sorts of activities of, of painting and gardening and such be done on weekends when there are no kids around. Mm-hmm. And some schools do that and some schools don't. I know of one school that's located 
two blocks away from a truck terminal. And so there's a lot of diesel exhaust there. So it goes way beyond just the individual child. It's their living environment, their social environment. It brings us to the point that's very controversial in certain areas, and that is the importance of doing a home visit because a lot of the triggers unknown to the parents might be in the home. Yes. But yet we have this adage, a uh, person's home is their castle. Right. But at the same time, a comprehensive program requires a home visit. Right. Why don't you tell us some of the experiences you've had with trying to overcome some of the resistance you might encounter for home visits? The um, challenge is trying to explain and, and educate the, the family that we can make the child better. It's not we can change what you're doing, but putting it in the format of if they don't have cockroaches or they don't have dust or that things can be done around the house to make things better. And true, in South Carolina, we have a, a group which is a group of experienced parents of children with health issues of all kinds, not just asthma, but they do home visits. So they have a kind of an investment in this because they've gone through it themselves exactly. with a positive outcome. Yes, yes. And, and so it actually becomes peer counseling. The person coming to visit looks like and talks like the, the parent, mm -hmm. and they're able to say, this worked for my child, and you may not know it, but... Another thing that is a, a major problem is trying to get families to decrease cigarette smoke exposure. And so each state has a, a quit line. It's 1-800-QUIT-NOW. The coverage for tobacco cessation is expanding so that it's possible for families to help grandma or grandpa or whomever get over their addiction to tobacco. It takes three hours for the smoke from one cigarette to clear out of a room. But it also is probably going to be captured in the fabric because there is some residual odor. Yes. We can all smell when we yes. walk into that hotel exactly. room. Exactly. I usually figure that if I can get someone to just smoke outside, I'd rather they didn't smoke at all, but if at least sure. they will smoke outside and never in the car, that getting them to take a shower and change clothes mm -hmm. is icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. So I don't usually push to that point, but uh, it is definitely a, a consideration. But the main thing is to get the smoking outside, away from the car, and that sort of thing. Interestingly enough, you mentioned you're from South Carolina. I'm from California, and legislation was recently passed to prohibit smoking in a car in the presence of a child. Excellent. And unfortunately, I very observant and I'm driving and I'm seeing people in the car smoking with yes. children and it's yep. just right. It's like cell phone use. You're not yes. supposed to do that. Exactly. Another issue that comes up with home visits, pets, yes. exotic or traditional pets. Yes. How do you deal with, with that issue? I tell them, don't get rid of the dog until I do some, some testing to see mm -hmm. whether your child has any indication of a reaction to the dog. We can tell you with blood testing or skin testing whether the dog or the cat or dust mites or mm -hmm. the oak tree out in front or whatever is the major issue. Mm -hmm. Dust mites are a problem, and I don't think people realize that in the U.S., um, the average ma mattress doubles its weight in eight years. Mm -hmm. And that increase in weight is all the body and debris from dust mites. I tell folks when I meet them, don't do any major expenditure without talking to me because someone knowing your child has asthma is going to try to get you to take up your carpet and put down wood floors. Mm -hmm. And that may or may not affect mm -hmm. your child, mm -hmm. but don't invest many kilobytes. In other words, don't overreact until right. we have all the facts. Until we get more information, because it's a very individual yeah. sort of thing. This is a very individualized approach you're taking. Each child, each home is different. Everybody yes. is reacting different to the triggers. So part of the detective work is to find out what triggers really are most important for that particular patient. Yes, and, and when a child is not, or anybody with asthma, when they're not doing well, it's important to find out if they're taking the medicine that's been prescribed. Mm -hmm. And it's also important to find out if they've done the trigger control that you've recommended, or has, it, has trigger identification been done, and what do you do about it? Mm -hmm. One of the things that affects a lot of kids that, that isn't 
recognized is acid reflux and viral illnesses. I will ask folks, the parents or the and or the kids, is there heartburn? Is there are there sour burps? But I also ask, does the child have bad breath in the morning? And I have had families say, oh yeah, you don't want to get anywhere near that child first thing in the morning. And I've heard it described as dumpster breath mm. and kitty mm -hmm. litter box mm -hmm. breath in the morning for this child, not the other two, but this one. And it turns out then that treating the acid reflux along with the asthma treatment makes the asthma sure. treatment much sure. more effective. Viral illnesses, frequently the symptoms of the virus morph into an asthma flare. Parents will say, oh yeah, the, the colds hit her bad. It's always two weeks and it always takes an antibiotic and prednisone to get her over it. Um, very often that's a sign mm -hmm. that we've gone from the virus to a mild asthma flare. And if we control the asthma better, they revert to having three or five day colds rather than two weeks. So colds. another subtle trigger in terms of someone who has yet to be diagnosed with asthma is how long they're away from school with the common cold, as opposed three or four days, but yet certain children might be two weeks. So exactly. that's another indicator, not yes. quite a trigger, but certainly a trigger that something is not right. Yes, it's something that needs investigation and folks need to explore just like exercise isn't recognized as much as it should be as a trigger for asthma, colds can also... I was going to say, how about cold air in the, in the colder climates during the winter? Yes, that can definitely be something as well. What the, about yeah, warm, humid air uh, in the southern uh, states during the summer months? That can be a major problem, and it again requires looking to see when, in the course of a whole year, mm -hmm. when does the child do well and when do they not do well? And very often families will say, oh, it's just the allergies in the spring. Mm -hmm. It may be, but it may be other things as well. People also frequently uh, don't recognize that the annual back to school asthma flare occurs. In South Carolina, Medicaid has to pay 40% more each year for childhood asthma care for August and September compared to June and July. That is due to the, the flare-ups of asthma needing to go to the ER. Oh, I thought it was gone. He did all just fine over the summer. Mm -hmm. And then with a resounding crash, the child is sick as soon as they get back to school mm -hmm. and they wind up in the ER. So it's a really important for the family to keep a track record, so to speak, so they can have the because recalling what happened during a crisis is, is hard. So yes. you probably encourage the parents to jot down for future use when you interview them and you talk to them because it's a, it's a living document, it yes, sounds like, it trying is. to identify. And all this is actually reduced down to an action plan yes. for the parents and for the child. It's an action plan. It, it is also uh, the asthma control test, which is commonly used as a way of surveying the parent and child back for the last month about how well controlled are the symptoms, the cough, the wheeze, the exercise, the sleep. And so for younger kids, it's some questions for the child and some questions for the parents. For kids uh, and teens, uh, it is just for the patient, but it gives you the caregiver, or the prescriber, a chance to really understand. And for the younger ones, it's not uncommon that we'll have the parents say, I didn't know you couldn't run around the block in, or around the, the build of the track in PE. Well, you never asked me because they don't volunteer that sort of thing. So the asthma control test as part of the intake can be very helpful. It seems to me like aside from being a physician, you have to be an investigator or a detective. Yes. Plus an educator. Yes. Plus a public health advocate. Yes. So your plate is actually full, but that's what it takes to control asthma, which is a lifelong disease and can be well controlled. Well, Dr. Bowman, thank you very much. And I'm sure our viewers and our listeners will find this very informative. Great. Thanks I again. appreciate it. Thank you. You've been watching A Clinical Breath, respiratory insights from industry leaders. Brought to you by the Monaghan Medical Corporation. Monaghan means it matters. Thank you for watching and tune in again for more respiratory-related topics.